In Wisconsin's capital, lawmakers are working on the third HOPE package to fight heroin and opioid addiction. But the headlines just this week, overdose suspected in death of four-year-old in Milwaukee, and there's a new drug killer in carfentanil. So it's time for an update on the fight against heroin and opioid and other addictions with Attorney General Brad Schimmel and R.J. Lur Quinn uh, of the Dane County Sheriff's Department Drug Task Force. Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming in for an update. Thank you, Steve. Um, let's start first with this week's headline news. Carfentanil, now they're up to three deaths potentially in Milwaukee County and potentially one in Dane County. Um, talk to me about the new drug in the state, carfentanil. Is this a surprise to anybody? We've seen it in other places starting first. Um, in Ohio, it really poked its head up first and another nice wholesome Midwestern state where these things are popping up. And we've, we've been anticipating, we're watching for it. Um, over a year ago, our crime lab got some samples so that we, we, need, we have to have a standard to test against. One of the challenges is that the fentanyls and all the way up to the most powerful one we think is carfentanil, um, with these, th it's, it's not being made by a pharmaceutical company. Well, that's it's important. being made by, by, by illicit labs and typically in Mexico. And they're getting the, the raw ingredients, producing that and shipping it up here for sale. So it's hard for us to, to keep up with the chemical changes. There, there are quite a few different types of fentanyls now that are available and they're all 50 to 100 times more potent than the very potent heroin we have for stay on the street. Have we graduated then from heroin, opioids, fentanyl now to car fentanyl, Sergeant? It appears that way. Um, like the Attorney General said, we, we saw it in different areas of the country and unfortunately it started working its way toward the Midwest and, and now it is here. We, like you said, there's been a couple reported cases in Milwaukee and we've had one reported in the Madison area. So it unfortunately has worked its way up to this area and unfortunately will probably to continue to spread until we get it under control. Well, I used to be scared reading the headlines on fentanyl. Now I'm petrified the headlines on car fentanyl. Um, talk to me about the relationship between those two drugs, one of you gentlemen. They're, they're different, more potent chemical formulations. It's one of the challenges we've had with legislation at, at the state and federal level is trying to keep up with what is illegal and they change the chemical structure, it makes it harder for us to, to make the case against them. But in the end, this all starts with someone, um, in almost all cases, with someone abusing prescription narcotic painkillers. Okay. They become addicted, and then it's heroin, then it's more and more potent drugs that they're, they're, on the, they're looking for. And, and more and more, they, the drug cartels are recognizing that they have much more profit to be made by making these different types of fentanyl in labs rather than going out and growing poppies to make heroin. Sergeant, um, when your officers, uh, officers go out, not knowing what drug they may be dealing with, how does this change how they react? Is there more danger when there's carfentanil out there? Just give me the street perspective, please. Yeah, I mean, there is certainly a huge concern in law enforcement um, and, and the medical field and anybody who comes in contact with Obviously, first it was it was heroin, um, and then it was heroin laced with fentanyl, and now it's carfentanil. You get, um, we we may go to uh, do a search warrant or or get a hold of, um, you know you know this drug through through our law enforcement actions, and we have to test it and or send it to the crime lab, and they have to test it. Now there's procedures to do that, but but the concern is when we're out in the field or back back at our evidence areas, you know, do, to make sure that we're safely handling this stuff because even just getting a small amount on your hands or breathing it can be a, a, a medical disaster for law enforcement. So that's a huge concern just that we have to deal with. Excuse me, just in the course of investigating that crime, right. that poses a threat to your law officers. Then it goes to your crime labs, which your agency offers. Now, do your crime labs then have to, have to recalibrate and reinvent testing for some of these drugs, these str uh, street-made drugs? Yes, we're, co we're constantly having to update our, our, our standards. The, a standard is the, the known that we test against when we, when we run it through a gas chromatograph. And you know, to the sergeant's point, we've had, we have new protocols at the Division of Criminal Investigation at, D at DOJ where 
w if we're testing an unknown powdered substance, there have to be two officers present. They have to be gloved and masked. There has to be Narcan in the room because we recognize if this stuff, a small amount that gets into the air, you inhale that, a small amount gets through your transdermally through your skin, that can be an overdose death. Somebody has to be there to be able to administer Narcan to bring that, that officer back to life. Um, well, let's go back to carfentanil for a moment. How great a danger does it pose in terms of, do you expect it to dramatically and significantly increase, show up more and more statewide, General? This seems to be the trend. Um, the users are looking for a higher high. They call it chasing the dragon. They're trying to get the high they had the first time they used. As I understand it from people in recovery, you don't ever get there. You can't ever achieve that first high again, but you keep trying to chase after that. And, and the drug cartels know that, so they're, it's a competitive market. They're marketing more and more potent drugs. But the part of the problem is, is you don't know what you're buying when you buy this stuff. It's, it's a white powdery or chunky substance. You don't know what the potency is. You don't know if you're buying 22% pure heroin, 50% pure heroin, or worse, you're buying something that's laced with fentanyl. We're finding some cases now where marijuana has been laced with other drugs. We're concerned that that will include fentanyl uh, down the road. All these different things. You don't know what you're buying, and that's part of the danger. Fentanyl, uh, and then as you get more potent and potent with uh, car fentanyl, it, this is a very, very small amount. It, when you look at the heroin, takes a very small amount. Well, this is one hundredth of the of the amount of drug. Heroin is. Uh, let's put it the other way. Carfentanil is a hundred times more lethal than heroin. Have I said that correctly, General? Uh, well, just the just fentanyl okay. is fifty to one hundred times more potent than heroin, and carfentanil takes it up a notch. Fentanyl is is 1,000 times as potent as a morphine equivalent dose. Then how does someone out there chasing the next tie, chasing the dragon, do they have any way to know what they're illicitly and illegally buying, Sergeant? No. They don't? The, the simple answer So is there's no advice to them? Well... To try to stay alive? Right. I mean... We certainly would, l we have advice, and, and the simple fact is obviously don't buy drugs, but that's, that's not the answer. I mean, I'm sure. You have to get beyond that. To right, we, we have to. practical advice. Ex exactly. Excuse me yeah, for that, no, that, and that's true. That's just not practical advice, and we've seen that th with the struggles we've been dealing with over the last couple of years. But you're right, the normal person that goes out and buys drugs on the street has really no idea what they're buying. They may say, I'm. I'm, I want to buy heroin or cocaine or something like that. And as the sellers may say, that's what they're selling. But um, we're seeing that a lot of our drugs are laced with fentanyl. And now, unfortunately, it's even gone to a, the next step of car fentanyl. And the reason they do that is, be, like, like the attorney general said, it's cheap. You have it's cheaper to get these um, drugs like carfentanil and fentanyl and you can cut your product with that so you it's it's a money making thing for the for the drug dealers in the cartel because now they're selling less of the heroin and more of the fentanyl or carfentanil and it's that's where the money is unfortunately so yeah it's just a vicious cycle you know this kind of circles back around to the the point I've been trying to make um, since I've been Attorney General is for a long time we've tried to control drug issues by going after the supply side. Well, we're seeing here some of the challenges with going after the supply side. We have got to focus on the demand side. We've got to stop Wisconsinites from ever experimenting with, with usually it's prescription painkillers. And once, once you start down that path, you're, you're headed toward this. You'll get to this point that you don't know what you're buying. That is, that was the one good thing when people can get their hands on, um, on the prescription painkillers. At least you do know what's in those. Although there's a caveat, because we've in Wisconsin we have caught some drug, uh, some drug uh, traffickers who are making pills now, with, they're, they're using the illicit drugs. So we're losing that too. You might be buying what looks like a 40 milligram oxycontin, but it's not. Is Narcan uh, uh, is that successful in treating fentanyl and carfentanil, or, or are we beyond that, sir? It's 
it's effective, but you're going to need more doses. It, the, the, more powerful, the more powerful the opiate that you overdosed on, the, you're going to have diminishing return from the Narcan. And there's certainly a point at which you'll have taken such a potent dose that Narcan isn't going to bring you back. So, Sergeant, uh, t talk about Narcan. Um, if someone is brought back by Narcan, they realize that they could have died. Why then, over the next 28, 48 hours, maybe within a week, they would use again if their life has been saved by Narcan? What am I missing here? I, I just think it's it's the it's the addiction, um, the the need for that drug, the need for that high, and and I've seen numerous cases, and law enforcement agencies all over the state have seen numerous cases where um, they they've dealing with people that have they've narcaned six, seven, eight, nine, ten times throughout the course of weeks or months, but the addiction drives that person back to that drug of choice, whatever that might be, and I know you mentioned. You mentioned the word treatment with Narcan, and, and I want to make... That's the wrong term. Thank you. Yeah. I, Correct me. If you don't mind. I, Please. I, I wouldn't say... I, I wouldn't consider Narcan a treatment. I would consider it Narcan as, as something that we use as a tool. Thank you. Um, but it's not... Cons I, I wouldn't consider it treatment because it doesn't really treat the main issue of okay. the addiction. So um, someone has used an illegal drug, and an officer mm -hmm. finds him and say brings them back with Narcan. And did I hear you say earlier, they ask, why did you interrupt my high? I, I have had that happen, yes. On, on more than one occasion, we've had people who were on death's door and law enforcement has administered Narcan and what I would consider saved their life. And the first comments have been, you ruined my high or, or why did you ruin my high? And, and the that officers I, then yeah. say, I was saving your life, ma'am or sir. Right? Yes. But again, that's really the addiction talking. And you can just see how controlling that addiction can be to the point where y you don't think about the fact that you might die. You just think about getting that high. You know, there's another point to this. It, it, many times, by the time people are shooting up opiates, they're no longer getting high. They're just keeping from getting sick. I mean, they, they've r there's no joy in their life. They can't even get the joy of being high anymore. And when, when Narcan's administered, y there's actually a balance to strike. Administer enough to bring them back to life, but don't plunge them all the way into deep withdrawals because now they're going to go mm -hmm. immediately into that sickness. But ultimately, they're administering Narcan isn't the, shouldn't be the end of the story with this individual. We, need not, we now need to work to get them some kind of help or we will be back doing it again. We know in our drug treatment court in Waukesha County, when I was DA there, we, we knew that on average, the people coming into our drug treatment court had been brought back to life seven times. Seven times. By Narcan. Uh -huh. That's the average. And I want to ask about one other thing that was reported today in the journal Sentinel. If the death of the four-year-old is confirmed as an overdose, we're talking Milwaukee County, it would be the seventh child under the age of five to have died of a drug overdose in the last 19 months in Milwaukee County. I'm too naive on this. How can children as young as two, three, four, and five die of drug overdoses? Because when there's a when there's a parent or caregiver or other or some other family member in that house that has is using and they leave their they leave their paraphernalia or residual of the drug around, children get into that. They they get it on their fingers, put their fingers in their mouths, they pick up the paraphernalia, put that in their mouths. Um, the the idea of of we, we need to be very concerned about the dangers to children in homes like that. Wisconsin's actually a leader in the nation when it comes to our drug endangered children programs. We have the, ma the majority of the counties in our state have DEC or drug endangered children programs that go beyond just studying the drug incident that happened in that house, but, but go into looking with all the systems, human services, public health, law enforcement, everybody engages together to focus on what do we do to make sure the children in that house aren't put in danger again. Uh, uh, I want to turn to a different tone. I want to ask, is there any good news here? So, General, the, in the Capitol, they're working on the HOPE 3 package. We passed HOPE 1, HOPE 2. Yeah. Um, do you see some progress as a result of HOPE 1, 2, and what's been the most effective tools in HOPE 1 and 2? What are you most hopeful about in HOPE 3, sir? Well. There is definitely reason to be optimistic. Five years ago, I, I think we felt like John the Baptist out in the wilderness. Nobody was listening, and now we're getting um, we're get 
everybody seems to get now that we do need to take this seriously and everybody wants to be part of the solution. Um, we still have a long way to go. We've seen some progress. Um, between 2015 and 2016, the last three months of those two years, when mm -hmm. we compared them, we found that prescribing of opioids went down by 11% in Wisconsin. That's great news because no law did that. You've got buy-in from the medical yep. community and the pharmacists. Right. And now there's a new database, but you were probably going to tell me about yep. that, so I don't want to steal your... Go ahead, sir. And, <laughs> you know, and we, ha we have our next drug take back day coming up on April 29th. The last two Staggering numbers. Yes. I keep interrupting you. In, in, in two years, we've collected over 207,000 pounds of unused medications in Wisconsin. That's almost 12 semi-trucks full. In April of last year, we were number three in the nation for the amount we collected. Last October, we were number two in the nation. Only Texas collected more than us. This is great news because what it tells you is that the average household in Wisconsin understands they have a role to play in this solution. That's great progress. This, you know, the first thing is to get people engaged, to get people to understand. When you look at our legislature, when you talk about the HOPE legislation, it's been passing 17 aggressive bills in the last two sessions, passed unanimously. So far, HOPE 3 passed unanimously in the, in the, assembly. In the assembly. We're waiting on the Senate yet. I have no reason to think it's not going to pass overwhelmingly in the Senate, and the governor will sign these things, and we'll continue to be aggressive in this fight. But before I ask the sergeant a question, do the street dealers and the cartels stay one step ahead of uniform officers like him and the lawmaking process? You know, part of the problem is is, is the nature of, and I don't want to go too far out beyond my skills with, with the sergeant here, but. The, the nature of what a drug dealer is has changed. There aren't drug houses like we had years ago where you knew where people were going to buy this. Now it's a throwaway cell phone that the, the dealer uses for a very brief period of time. They will, they will meet you in a, um, in a restaurant parking lot or wherever, transfer the drugs. You don't even know who you're buying the drugs from. Um, well, Sergeant, is there any good news out there as someone from the street level? on this issue? There is, and, and re referring back to, I've, I've been in our drug unit for almost five years now, and I think back when I first started, even the change that, that has gone on. Um, you look at, and I, I made copies of, of the what, nine recent bills that have just gone through. Um, all of these are in an effort to, to get help to not, not only the person that's addicted, but when you start talking about all the families that are involved and all the the employers. I just did a conference for um, risk managers amongst the state and, and the amount of, and they were really interested because the amount of money and um, job time lost and all the issues that they have to deal with from a business aspect. And this, right. this was not only right. county and, and state um, agencies, but the private sector too. So, so these type of bills, when you start talking about, you know, special schools or you start talking about additional money for training for doctors and, and additional money for um, alternatives to prosecution. Because the days of, of law enforcement arresting a, a user, putting them in jail for whatever, six months a year, three months, whatever, and then just cutting them loose, those days have to go away because it, it's not really doing anyone any favors. Now, on the law enforcement side, we, we will certainly arrest people when we have to, and we understand that's our job. but. It, we're doing a disservice to that addict and that addict's family and everyone else involved in that addict's life if we don't at least provide them with more than just incarceration. Well, the, cha the change that needs to happen is, is and, and is <coughs> happening, is that we can't view the incarceration as the answer to the Correct. problem. It, it, is, it is often a piece of it because, frankly, sometimes having that person in the jail is the only way we're going to stop them from shooting up again that night or the next morning. So we get them there and that's and it can be our, our foot in the door because once they once they get clean in the jail for a brief period, we can start having a conversation with them about would you how about drug treatment court? Would you consider putting in the effort there? But as a as a criminal justice system, you know, for a long time we kind of functioned under Albert Einstein's definition of insanity where we did the same thing over and over again and expected a different result. So we should, it was no wonder we had such terrible recidivism rates and still do with any, when you're dealing with people of an alcohol and other drug abuse issue. It, it doesn't work to just confine them and expect that they'll come out and be fine. 
it works for some. But mm -hmm. frankly, now that the opiates are, are such a big problem, it's very few. So now we work very much, as they're coming out of the jail, we're looking for ways, or prison, we're looking for ways to be changing their behavior long term. Has there been a paradigm, sh paradigm shift in the um, treatment resources over the last five years? Some of the things you've just been referred to. Instead of arresting them, locking them up, and compounding the problems, are there more treatment resources than five years ago? We now have 50 counties in Wisconsin that have either have an existing drug uh, treatment and diversion court or are in the process of putting one in place right now. That's fabulous news. Um, and some of the tribes have it as well. We're, we're working to get this to be available to any county because this problem's affecting every county. We'll keep moving toward that. We're seeing the legislature and the governor focusing more money on this. Every time, every time we have a new session, they fi they're finding more money to put into this, and that's all great news. Um, some of this, the HOPE three legislation involves getting money to training more people, getting money to enticing people into doing this work. Frankly, for a long time, we've paid so poorly when it comes to alcohol or the drug abuse and mental health treatment that there's, there's just not enough people doing the work in those fields. We need to, we need to raise the, the reimbursement rates to attract more people in. We, a 2013 Wisconsin uh, State Council on Al and Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse uh, survey found over 163,000 people in Wisconsin abusing opiates in some manner. We cannot treat 163,000 people. And um, there are a number of ways that we can start addressing this. We need to get more treatment um, capabilities. We also need to start intervening earlier. And the sergeant made a great point about working with employers. We're doing this because employers can be a place where we could start helping people sooner. Typically right now, by the time we get a chance to work with somebody, we've got them under arrest. And they've blown up everything. They long ago lost their job. They've, they've, their family has, has kicked them out because they can't, they can't do anything anymore to work with them. Right. They've lost everything. And now we have to, we need this much in resources to try to get this person back to healthy. If there was a way to, to get people to seek help earlier on, maybe we need this much in treatment resources and we could expand our capabilities then. You talked about one family. Wisconsin and I has been working on a documentary on this issue for more than a year and you'll be seeing it soon. But now let's, let's listen to the um, one, let's listen to Adele's situation. And it's about a little bit more than two minutes. So let's talk to, uh, uh, let's hear from Adele's parents and let's hear from Adele and let's hear from Adele's brother. Two minutes on Adele and her problems with addiction and her comeback. Addiction is known as a family disease because it doesn't just impact the person that's using, it impacts people's family, their friends, their co-workers, their teachers, everybody. If you've known anybody that's ever struggled with active addiction, it's probably impacted you. It hit us like a ton of bricks when she went into the hospital the first time with heroin overdose because we had no idea. So that was a huge shock. We did not see it coming. No, not at all. I didn't know what to do or how to feel. I was literally, I couldn't hardly think of what to do. I was furious, um, hurt, embarrassed, walk around with knots in your stomach 24 hours a day, waiting for the next call, what's it gonna be, what is it? You know, the, the begging, the, Threatening. Uh, it would just... The deal making, you know, just the constant. The phone would ring and your heart would just stop because you just were expecting it to be that phone call that said she's gone. Pretty amazing, really, from where she was to what she's doing now. I mean, assumed a funeral was coming before anything, really. But it all came crashing down just as it always does. Um, and I, my parents put me on the streets. They, enough is enough. She isn't, she's done controlling our lives. It's not gonna happen anymore. And I made the decision, and it was the hardest thing I ever did. Um, I said, she's not coming back in the house until she gets stuff together. By making that decision, there was times she showed up, rain and cold, whatever, and 
I turned her away. I said, no, you're not coming in here. I mean, I didn't let her know, but I went back to the room and cried. Because <laughs> that was my daughter that I just said no. But I had to for us, for the family. The story of Adele, which we just heard, is this very t fairly typical, gentlemen? You know, there's not there's not a typical. I there's so many, di but I, I would say it's common. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I you know when I was DA, I I there were quite a few times I got calls on Monday morning when I got into the office, and it would be a parent saying, "I finally called police. My child is in your jail, Mr. Schimmel. Please don't let them get out, because we've." My husband or my wife and I, we've slept through the night for the first time in as long as we can remember this weekend because we finally knew they were safe somewhere. That's a terrible decision for a parent to have to make, but they do. As Adele struggles with staying clean, what's the biggest challenge for her, Sergeant, do you think? Well, I think the biggest challenge for her will just be able to, to recognize if she's starting to go down that wrong path again, because there are so many temptations that that sh she will be put in front of, um, and, and it, it's going to be up to her and her family and her support group and and ho hopefully her counselors or whatever she's doing to to stay mm -hmm. straight to make sure that she does, because the temptations, whether they're um, from from old friends or, or or just anything, are going to be very difficult for her and it sounds like she's heading in the right direction so I, w I certainly wish her well but that's going to be a big struggle knowing that those contacts and that um, environment is readily available to her if she decides to go down that dark path again. Adele, I'm we do wish you well. Go ahead, I'm General. really glad you chose a story where you have someone that's succeeding, that there's recovery because that so many of the too. stories right. are ending the other way but people should see that there is hope. If if you engage, if you if we work at it, if we get help to people, there are people in recovery, many thousands of them, and we can do this. It can work, and we've always got to maintain that hope. Good luck, Adele. D uh, two final questions. We're almost out of time. As law enforcement professionals, are you concerned when states like Colorado, California, Washington, and Oregon, I hope I've got the states right, are beginning to legalize recreational marijuana? Just a quick response, General? I, I am. Um, and, and I don't want to overstate this. It, it, marijuana is not killing people directly. And, and certainly n it, it's not everyone who starts using marijuana moves on to more dangerous drugs. But many, many of the people um, we find using more dangerous drugs did start with marijuana. It still does remain a gateway in that sense. And, and I'm concerned too that um, it does have hazards. It can be addictive according to the Centers for Disease Control. Um, it, um, it can be dangerous when you mix it with driving, when you mix it with other substances. And like with the heroin you buy on the street, you don't know what's in the marijuana you buy on the street either. So as we move toward, toward that, I think sanctioning this as a society is a dangerous message to send to young people. Your response, sir? Oh, I would agree. Just simply the, and, and many people have heard this already, but the, the marijuana that's grown now um, is, is high-grade marijuana with a much higher THC level than, than in years past. Along with that comes other types of marijuana edibles, which are, I mean, small candies that, that people are using and those kind of things. So there is, a, uh, there is a correlation between the higher amounts of THC in marijuana and how people can become addicted to it and then, uh, and then move on to something else because they, their body becomes immune to that certain level that marijuana gets them to, so then they seek out that, that next right. level of drug that will get them to that high or a higher high than they got with marijuana. Okay, uh, uh, okay we're down to our final minute, so final question. What's at stake in this debate over the, in the next three or four years out? Sergeant, you want to go first? You mean as far, as far as the legalization? No, in terms of what's at stake with um, uh, our struggle to help those who are addicted and the increasing level, heroin, opiate, sure. fentanyl, carfentanil. What's at stake? Well, I think at stake is just the, the quality of living for, for all the citizens of, of Wisconsin. And what's at stake is the fact that we need to address this and put all of our resources that we can toward getting people 
healthy again. And when I mean healthy, I mean not only physically but mentally. And like I said before, that doesn't that also includes the the addict, but the addict's parents or their friends and, and all that support network because you you look at the video we just saw with mom and dad and how they're struggling and the brother and, and I've I've been to a lot of different areas of of that family level where I've talked with people and, and it's a struggle and we want to keep that family unity to, together so th I think a lot of that's at stake with with making sure that they get all the help they need and we can move on. General, you watched the overdose issue as a DA and now Attorney General. What's at stake looking out three, four years, sir? This, this is the very health and safety of our state and this is driving much more than just the, the challenges physically to the addicted person who's abusing these substances, they have to find a way to support their habit. They're, they are, mm -hmm. it, this is driving increases in all kinds of crime. It's affecting the very fabric of our society. We have got to work to reduce this demand. We've got to, we've got to work hard to prevent new people from coming into this danger. Attorney General Brad Schimmel and Dane County Sergeant R.J. Lur Quinn, thank you so much. There's no more important topic for this newsmaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.